Everything that you've ever known about hamburgers is wrong. We all know what hamburgers are, the iconic beefy patty with cheese and toppings and sandwiched in between two buns. And we've come to love the corporations that sell them, like McDonald's with their Big Mac and nostalgic children's play place. Of which half of our parents wouldn't even let us go on because they thought we'd start licking the slide and catch syphilis. But that's just as much part of being a kid as eating mud or torturing small animals. So what did they know? And while hamburgers seem to have an identity that's as American as a coup in a third world country, the reality is the true history of hamburgers has been hidden from you all of these years. Join me as we delve into the real history and the mystery of burgers. The invention of the hamburger is a highly disputed topic in the historical culinaryography world, with many thinking that it was invented around the beginning of the 20th century. However, <clears throat> that's what the average historian wants you to think, and trust me, I ain't that guy. To find the true origins of the hamburger, we have to travel much further back in time, all the way back to... This is gonna take forever. <laughs> There we go, 2.6 million years ago, I'm not even joking. The discovery of tool making was a major milestone in human history, transitioning our ancestors from little beta weirdos gathering berries to alpha male hunters and craftsmen. We started making things that sting. These were basic tools, like hammer stones for skull breaking or sharp stone flakes for cutting, but it allowed them to hunt and process the meat of the animals they encountered. And later on, with the discovery of fire, they were able to utilize these tools to cut up the meat and then form them into patties that closely resemble the hamburger patties of today. So how did they cook these patties over the fire? Well, they required a specialized tool. There is an extensive classified archaeological record in the Smithsonian Archives. Don't ask me how I got access to this. It contains up to 25 highly preserved artifacts of what scholars believe to be the ancient equivalent of the burger flipping spatula of today. Beyond that, fossilized meat patties have been discovered in ancient caves in Europe, Africa, and Asia. And these fossils provide us with a rare glimpse into the meat composition of these early hamburgers including those from large herbivores, such as mammoth and bison. These caves also contain other groundbreaking archaeological finds, such as these cave paintings found that depict people eating burgers, giving us an idea of the cultural significance of burgers in our prehistoric ancestors' lives. Now, around 10,000 years ago, the wild ox was first domesticated, which led to a consistent production of beef and milk. This led to the invention of the cheeseburger and an explosion of agriculture, which eventually led to the adoption of the hamburger bun. This was pretty sick because Previously, patties were placed between two large mushroom caps, as can be seen in this cave paint. Problem with that was we didn't know which ones were poisonous or not, and anyone who figured it out had died. As you can probably tell, the hamburger has always been an enduring part of humanity's history, but let me be the first to tell you, it didn't stop there. Hamburgers took hold in a variety of cultures across the world, but one of the more notable occasions was in the Roman Republic in 44 BC. Julius Caesar had just declared himself dictator for life of the Roman Republic, and shortly after had banished his son Caesar II, also known as Little Caesar, for his controversial ideas regarding early Roman pizza. This event had a profound impact on the culinary landscape of the Roman Republic, as with banishing his weird son and outlawing the production of pizza, it created a culinary power vacuum. Early Roman cheese burgers quickly emerged as the main dish that was consumed, as they were easy to prepare and could be consumed quickly. And the cheeseburger's popularity can absolutely be seen in the cultural works and artifacts discovered from this time period. Roman coins from this period heavily feature cheeseburger iconography, demonstrating the importance of this dish in Roman culture. And beyond that, frescoes found in Pompeii and Herculaneum, two cities destroyed by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD, if you were paying attention in school you would know that, depict scenes of people enjoying cheeseburgers at banquets and street stalls. The rise of cheeseburgers also coincided with the rise of the Roman Republic, which facilitated a spread of cheeseburger culture throughout the Mediterranean world. And later on, this would lead to great strides in math and science, such as when Greek mathematician Archimedes was able to calculate an even more accurate number for pi when he was inspired by the cheeseburger he was having for lunch. Oh yeah, that's right, pi. 
We're talking 3.14159265358979323846264 I'm in Ireland right now, visiting one of the most famous locations in Irish cheeseburger history. The McGillicuddy War occurred here, where they fought over the famous Irish Dubliner cheeseburger. These hallowed walls hold more history of the cheeseburger than I could possibly fathom, and it's really incredible to see it in person. But what I'm really here to talk about is the new gift shop that we opened at the museum. There's brand new items for you to get right now at incorrecthistory.com. The coast of these foreign lands whisper secrets into my ears, secrets telling me this is the best goddamn merch I've ever made. So head on over to incorrecthistory.com and get some sweet merch and a lesson in the history of cheeseburger culture. But who could talk about the spread of cheeseburger culture without, of course, talking about the influence of the Vikings? The Danish Viking invasion of England in the early 11th century is a very notable event in European history. The Vikings, led by King Swain Forkbeard, invaded England in 1013 AD, and they succeeded in kicking ass and taking names across the country, and it allowed Swain to be crowned King of England. What most historians don't mention, though, is that one of the factors that led the Danes to success was their cheeseburger-heavy diet. This food gave the Vikings the strength and vitality they needed to fight on the battlefield, as well as endure long marches and harsh conditions. And another key element of the Danish army was their infamous berserkers. Look at that guy. He's scary. Don't want to mess with him. Leave me out of it. The Berserkers were a group of warriors known for their ability to enter into a frenzied state of mind during battle. And they were fueled by a rare variety of Danish cheeseburger known as the Bear Burger. And if you have a hard time with context clues, it is, that's, that's bear meat. This burger put the Berserkers into a wild fury that is known to scholars as a Bear Burger meat rage. I mean, these guys were absolutely insane. We're talking like ripping people in half, running around the battlefield and roaring like a bear, like they're a furry two into character, but like in a scary way. Some of these Berserkers were particularly fearsome and earned their spot in legends, such as Eric Bolf Sandwich, who led a group of Vikings on a daring raid on a heavily fortified English castle, discovering a treasure trove of invaluable cheddar cheese. Ragnar Lothbrok, who was known for single-handedly slaying over a hundred English soldiers in the Battle of Asadon all while eating a cheeseburger. And who could forget Gudrun Bearson, who led a cavalry of bear-riding berserkers that tore across East Anglia, striking terror into the hearts of the English. When King Swain's heir Canute was crowned King of England, he brought the Danish cheeseburger culture with him and is often considered by scholars to be the very first Burger King. And after his death in 1035, the Burger King monarchy sought to expand its influence to the mythical land of Vinland, known to us now as Toledo, Ohio. Of course, in the history of the burger, some stories are held by individuals, such is the case with Van Gogh. Vincent Van Gogh is one of the most celebrated and well-known artists of the modern era. His works, characterized by dynamic brushstrokes and bold colors, are renowned for their emotional intensity and vivid representation of the human condition. Basically, the guy could paint. And while much has been written about Van Gogh's turbulent life and artistic vision, few have chosen to delve into his lesser-known period of inspiration his dreams of cheeseburgers. Van Gogh's cheeseburger period began in the summer of 1888 in the town of Arles in southern France. Look it up, I dare you, he was there. According to the letters written to his brother Theo, he was plagued by dreams of a mysterious food that he had never encountered before. A sandwich consisting of a juicy beef patty, melted cheese, and crisp lettuce and tomato, all served on a toasted bun. Though initially confused and disoriented by these dreams, Van Gogh soon became fixated on them, painting and sketching images of cheeseburgers in his Time. And these cheeseburger-inspired works were a departure from his usual subject matter. Instead of making landscapes and portraits, he was creating abstract, expressionistic pieces. One such work, titled Cheeseburger Sunrise, depicts a towering cheeseburger in a field against a vibrant orange and yellow sky, evoking the feeling of warmth and comfort that Van Gogh associated with the food. And despite the intensity of this cheeseburger-inspired art, Van Gogh never exhibited these works publicly. Scholars speculate that he feared that his peers would reject his unconventional subject matter. I mean, the guy was making giant paintings of cheeseburgers 
uh, in 1888, so, I mean, it was avant-garde. Nevertheless, the influence of this period can absolutely be seen in Van Gogh's later works, which incorporate elements of his cheeseburger-inspired style. For example, his painting Starry Night Over the Rhone features bold, swirling brushstrokes that evoke the same feeling of movement and energy as his earlier cheeseburger works. And while much of this cheeseburger art has been lost to history, its impact can still be felt in the enduring legacy of one of the world's most beloved artists. Okay, let's talk about World War II. America is often considered to be a highly cheeseburger-centric society in modern times. And throughout the history of the nation, that could absolutely be argued to be true. However, it wasn't until America involved itself in the European theater in World War II that the cheeseburger really started to take hold of American society. Due to the massive demand that the wartime supply chain placed on American industry, the U.S. government had to enforce food rations on the American public. Meat, cheese, bread, and various other grocery items were unable to be purchased without a government-issued food coupon. And this was due to the fact that the U.S. government had figured out that cheeseburgers were the ideal food to properly satisfy soldiers on the front lines. U.S. Army soldiers were supplied with Type C rations that almost always contained cheeseburgers. And the strength and vitality that the American soldiers got from consuming these sea ration cheeseburgers allowed them to make great strides and turn the tides of the war. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, cheeseburgers beat the Nazis. Some soldiers even reported in these questionably obtained Pentagon files that they obtained a certain level of superhuman ability. Others simply reported having a noticeable increase in sweating, and this was later referred to as a condition known as the meat sweats. Either way, upon returning to America, these soldiers were celebrated for their bravery, and with it, the cheeseburger was viewed as an enduring symbol of patriotism. Of course, not all things regarding the history of the burger were sunshine and roses, okay? And that was definitely not the case with the 1985 Hamburglar murder trial. The 1985 Hamburglar murder trial was a significant event in American legal history that captivated the nation's attention. The case involved a notorious criminal known as the Hamburglar. Yes, he is real. The Hamburglar was accused of committing regicide towards the reigning monarch of the Burger King kingdom. Burger King, as he was traveling in and out of his diplomatic trip to the White Castle. Allegedly, the Hamburglar had been witnessed snooping around the area near where the King had been killed by five guys who were traveling through the area for a checkers tournament. Two of the guys, Allen and Wright, promptly called the police. While the three others, Culver Hardy and his brother Carl Jr., attempted to detain the Hamburglar until Officer Big Mac could arrive on the scene to arrest him. Let's just say this did not go as planned. As the Hamburglar would then steal the five guys' white Ford Bronco, leading to a 45-minute long police chase that was televised live on news channels across the nation. It is estimated that over 91 million people were watching these broadcasts. Eventually, the Hamburglar was arrested and placed into custody, and the murder trial would begin. The prosecution's case was based mainly on circumstantial evidence and eyewitness accounts, which suggested that the Hamburglar was the killer. However, the defense team, led by Ronald McDonald and Grimace, suggested that the prosecution's evidence was flawed and that the Hamburglar had been wrongly accused. One of the more famous moments from this trial was when the prosecution pressured the Hamburglar to try on one of the critical pieces of evidence a cartoonish red glove found at the crime scene. Some legal scholars like to argue that the reason why the glove did not fit the Hamburglar was because he was already wearing an identical red glove, but nonetheless, this resulted in the controversial acquittal of the Hamburglar. This entire situation would later be recounted by the Hamburglar in his biographical true crime book, I Killed the Burger King, or Did I? He he. Despite everyone in the world mysteriously forgetting that the Hamburglar trials ever happened, Burger King would still continue its streak of bad luck. With the... In 1993, Burger King, after suffering the loss of their beloved King eight years ago, sought means to reinvigorate their brand. What they ended up doing is partnering with popular game developer Nintendo to promote the release of the highly anticipated live-action Super Mario Bros. movie. This promotional meal included a special burger known as the Bowser Burger, designed to look like Bowser's shell with spikes protruding from the bun. However, what started as a clever marketing strategy ended in a PR disaster for both Burger King and the Mario movie. According to reports, the recipe for these Bowser Burger spikes had accidentally been changed somewhere down the production line after the taste test had concluded. That ain't good. The spikes were initially meant to have a softness that was similar to the bun that they were on top of, but instead, they ended up having a hardness of 8.5 Mohs. Mohs is a scale of mineral hardness used in geology, with diamond at the top at 10 and talc at the bottom. In comparison, the human tooth has about a 5 on the Mohs scale, so if you're doing the math, 
the Bowser Burger spikes were harder than tea. As a result, many of the customers that ordered the Bowser Burger ended up with injuries, specifically to the roofs of their mouths. Burger King was quick to respond, issuing a public statement and pulling the Bowser Burger from their menu, but the damage had quite literally already been done. Across the nation, there were large, angry mobs of angry moms going from Burger King to Burger King and burning them to the ground. They were fucking pissed, dude. This controversy also affected the Super Mario movie, as parents who had planned to take their children to see the movie became wary of anything associated with the franchise. This created a cloud of doubt over the entire Super Mario brand, and the movie ultimately failed to live up to expectations. I mean, take a look at the box office data. This is a lift from Wikipedia. Just look it up. Of course, this is basic knowledge in the history of burgers, but there are some classified secrets that have eluded even the most experienced historical culinaryographer, such as... The year was 2011, and a group of researchers at Stanford University were working on a revolutionary project, a type of burger patty that had the same exact taste and texture of meat, but was made entirely of plants. Some would call it an impossible burger. And while this concept was controversial, the team of researchers believed that this technology could help for breakthroughs in other fields, such as finding the cure for cancer, or uh, solving fusion energy, hello. And they were on the cusp of success, mind you. They only had a single drop of soy protein left in order to finalize their creation. They were almost there. However, what the researchers were not prepared for was what happened next, because basically without any warning, Hell portal. Okay, listen, there's a reason why a lot of this history stuff gets swept under the rug, and that's because very often in the true history of things, hell portals open and demons emerge. I don't know what to tell you. It's a lot easier to do than you would think, and there's like a hundred ways to do it accidentally, and most of the time when it happens, it's a huge pain in the ass. Especially because in this case, this was a class five epsilon hell portal, which is oh god, that is not because you've got goo-boos. You don't wanna you don't wanna mess with a goo -boo. Greasy, sentient pillows with no cover. Those ants that ate the guy in Indiana Jones Kingdom of the Crystal Skull of the movie, but like twice as much. It's not good. An entire pride of lions with male pattern balding and an ability to smell fear. That is real bad. That one goose that lives by the pond in the park, you know, the one that's incredibly aggressive and attacks children? Yeah, no, he's here too. Billy Mays, but he doesn't introduce himself. Like in an egotistical way, as if we're supposed to know what his name is already, which is just fucked up, man. Emotionally intelligent frat guys. That's actually not that bad. Alternates. Bit of a niche reference, but if you know, then you know it's bad. Fat cactus again. I mean, look at the size of that. A perfect taco, except that there's razor blades in it. Halloween candy, except they're filled with marijuana and weed. A little nymph that follows you around and waits until you're in public and then starts just screaming racist shit in your voice. Big, tall giraffes, and they, with a machine gun neck. I have no idea how that's gonna look in editing. The researchers were able to close the portal by saying Bloody Mary three times in a mirror, but this disaster raised questions about the nature of meddling in forces beyond our understanding. Some saw it as a reminder to not play God, and it was to remind the scientists of their limitations. However, I've known for years that there was a third party in play here. Those who believe that burgers or any food should stay simply to their historical recipes. Recipes written by them based on history molded by them for thousands upon thousands of years. And this group, of course, is referred to as... The Dark Council is a secret society of food purists who have been active in various cultures and societies for thousands of years. While their work is not specific to food-based historical records, as an experienced historical culinaryographer, they have been a thorn in my side for my entire career. They elicit complete control over several large fast food corporations, and there are many historical figures and politicians today that are considered to be members of the Dark Council. Gandhi, William Howard Taft, Mother Teresa, Tucker Carlson, Al Gore, Judas, all known members of the Dark Council. And you can see their meddling across the entire history of the burger. Who changed the recipe for the Bowser burger? Dark Council. Who caused the Impossible Burger Hell Portal to appear? Dark Council. Who started the fire that destroyed many of Vincent Van Gogh's early works, including his cheeseburger paintings in January of 1886? Dark Council. And who really killed the Burger King? Well, it was, you know, it was probably the Hamburglar, but the Frickin' Dark Council covered it up, that's for goddamn sure. And while the Dark Council may be constantly meddling in the true history of the world, know this, friends. I will always be here, fighting them to set the record straight. Thanks so much for joining me on this episode of Factually True History. I'm your host, Ted Nivison. I'll see you next time. <laughs>